Yo, what's up guys? Welcome back to another video. This is a reaction to Mr. Ballin and the video is top three places you can't go and people who went anyways. Uh, this is a, I guess it's like a series of videos that he does and I've reacted to the t first two. I've not actually seen this one. I clicked it, but I haven't watched it. What's the other series that he does? Oh, there's another one that he does. I can't remember, but I've reacted to that one more. I think stories that you won't believe are true or something. Um, but I've reacted to this one a few times as well. And yeah, it's fascinating because you'll see people going into situations that they so obviously shouldn't. And they end up paying for them. But um, yeah, we're going to check this out and see some of these topics and these stories of these people doing these going into these situations. And I guess regretting it. But yeah, that's that. Links are in the description to my Patreon if you want to see some more of my reactions that I can't post to YouTube, but let's just check this out. Today I'm gonna to share with you three progressively more insane stories about people who went to forbidden locations and what happened to them. Spoiler alert, it didn't end well. But before I get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right channel because that's all I do and I upload three, four, even five times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please tear out the last chapter in every one of the Like Button's books. Also, please subscribe to this channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of my weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. I have to skip the intro because it's copyright or something. Stairway to heaven. On February 27th, 2015, 18-year-old Dalen Pua was visiting his grandmother on the Hawaiian island of Oahu. Dalen, who was a Hawaiian native himself, didn't spend much time in Oahu with his grandmother, and since he was here, he figured he would do the one thing he had always wanted to do, which was to climb the island's very famous and very illegal haiku stairs, or better known as the stairway to heaven. They look beautiful though. Flipping hell. I guess this is the top one, well, yeah, this obviously looks like the top. What a stupid question. Oh my days. These stairs were a very narrow, rusty, not well-maintained, 4,000 step staircase that weaved its way up the side of this Hawaiian mountain. It was built during World War II by the United States Navy because they wanted access to the top of this mountain where they had a secret radio station. After the war was over, instead of demolishing the steps, they allowed people to walk up and check out the view. But it was so dangerous and it was not well maintained that they eventually closed it to the public starting in 1987 and literally put a fence up and even put guards out to keep people from going in. But Dalen really wanted to do this. So that morning he tells his grandmother that he's thinking about hopping the fence and making the hike. And his grandmother's like, that's a horrible idea. Not only is it dangerous, but they're going to fine you thousands of dollars if they catch you doing that. Dalen backed down from what he said and he said, okay, okay, I won't go. And he kind of played it off like, I'm not going to go on this hike. But sure enough, right after breakfast, he slipped out of the house, hopped in a bus, and he made his way over to the base of these stairs. Even though it was totally illegal and he was incriminating himself, he was so excited about going on this hike that he documented the whole trip by posting pictures of it to his social media. And so the first picture begins with him at the base of the stairs where he posts a picture as he's about to start this hike. And then all morning, he's taking pictures along the way up these 4,000 stairs. But oh my days, they are literally... The... <laughs> They're literally, like, there's no route up. They're destroyed. But then around 11 a.m. that morning, the posting stops abruptly, and he hasn't reached the summit. And you figure, if you're going to do this hike, and you're already posting pictures of just the way up, certainly when you get to the summit, you're going to take a whole bunch of pictures and post all of those, because that's the prize at the end of this hike. But for whatever reason, the posting stopped at 11, and he clearly hadn't reached the summit yet. And by that night, when he didn't come home, the family was really concerned, and they told police. Police launched this huge search for him. They're looking all over the stairs. They got helicopters out. The Navy gets involved. There's no sign of him. He's just vanished. When they couldn't find him after several days, they had to call the search off, and the assumption was, well, you're doing something dangerous. There's a reason this is off limits. He mm. probably slipped at some point and fell down the mountain. That's why this is off limits. It's not safe. But when people reviewed some of his last photos that he had posted to social media, they noticed something in this picture. This shot looks like he's just taking a picture of the dense forest. There's someone following. Oh God, there's someone following. This is... Around the stairs. 
But if you look more closely, there is a man very clearly crouched down a little ways down the trail that appears to be hiding. And many people believe that that guy was following Dalen and at some point attacked him. That Dalen didn't fall off the mountain, he was abducted or killed. To this day, Dalen has never been found oh and that my. mystery man has never been identified. Flipping hell, man. All alone. The most remote island in the world is Bouvet Island. It is an uninhabited 19 square mile chunk of rock and ice situated in the South Atlantic. If you were looking on a map... Yeah, see... You see this, right? It's near Antarctica. I'm assuming it's pretty damn cold there. It's literally a tiny island where there's nothing... I mean, it's ice, like you just said, ice and rock. The closest it's to is probably South Africa. Why would you go here? For what reason... She's just asking for it at this point. ...and drew a 1,000 mile radius around Bouvet Island, there would be nothing else in it. There is no land, there is nothing. In fact, the nearest land is 1,100 miles away, and it's Antarctica that's not permanently inhabited. The nearest permanently inhabited land is South Africa, and that's 1,600 miles away. The wow. island is so far away from anything that in 1979, Israel and South Africa dropped two nuclear bombs on it and nobody noticed. The only reason anybody found out about it is because a US satellite happened to be looking in its direction and it saw two bright flashes of light and they were like, huh, I wonder what that is. And then it turned out to be nuclear testing. Damn. For the very few people that have gone to Bouvet Island, you can't just take a ship there or a boat there because all around the edges of this island are these jagged ice cliffs. And then the water is treacherous down near the edge of these cliffs with very strong currents. If you were to fall in, you'd get sucked up and probably underneath some of these rocks and then you're done for. So nearly anyone who's stepped foot on Bouvet Island has taken a helicopter and flown the long sketchy flight, hoping you don't hit a storm because you can't land anywhere. You're in the middle of nowhere with no land all the way to Bouvet Island. And then anyone that's been on Bouvet Island only stays for like a few minutes because they're so worried about a storm rolling in. And the weather at Bouvet Island is famously bad and storms are constantly rolling in. Oh, and Bouvet Island is an active volcano. So it's oh this my. horrible place that nobody goes to or should go to. But a few people still do. In 1964, British explorer Alan Crawford was sent out to Bouvet Island with a team of scientists to inspect the northwest corner of the island where a recent lava flow had created a shelf that looked like you could potentially build a building on it. And the British wanted to stand up a weather station out there, but they needed someone to go out there and give the green light. So on April 2nd, 1964, Crawford and his crew departed South Africa and began the long helicopter ride. When they finally touched down on Bouvet Island, everybody was on edge because you are in the most remote place in the world and if anything happens to you, there's no help coming for you. So people were eager to get the work done, survey the area and get right back on the helicopter and leave. So the team immediately gets to work surveying the site while Crawford decides to just for a couple minutes to step over the ridge and just look out at the island. He was fascinated with Bouvet Island and he just wanted to get a better look at it. So he walks up this embankment and he crests the hill and he looks down and there's this little rocky alcove that he can see the water. It's at this one area of the island where there's a little bit of a beach. And he sees a wooden lifeboat that's kind of half sunken sitting in the shallow waters of this lagoon. He couldn't believe it because he knows it's not theirs because they came in on helicopter. And he's also thinking, like, how could this boat have gotten here at all? The nearest land is 1,100 miles away. So he starts walking down towards the boat and he sees on the beach two wooden oars that he assumes go with the boat. Next to them is a flattened copper tank that's used to catch water. And then next to that was a wooden barrel, which also would have been used to store water. He starts looking around the beach for other signs of human life and there are none. There's no tent, there's no clothes no human remains. He finally gets down to the beach and actually wades out the little ways into the water to actually inspect this lifeboat. And he starts looking for identifying marks or numbers on- Why are you going into the water? <sighs> on the boat that might give away where it's from, but there's no significant marking on the boat. It was in pretty good shape, but there was just nothing to give away where it was from. Because Crawford knew they had very little time before they were gonna leave the island, he ran back on shore and he looked around on the beach some more and he walked up the hill a ways to get a look down the island to see if there's any sign of human life on this island, but there's none. And so he goes back over to his team and he tells them what he's found, but his team is so focused 
on getting this survey done and getting the heck out of here that they don't really care about <laughs> this lifeboat. And they nice. say, you know what, it probably washed up from some shipwreck or something. There's probably some explanation for it. Let's just get this done and get out of here. Crawford feels a little bit frustrated because he's fascinated by what he's just found and he wishes they were too. So he just walks back over the hill and he takes his camera out and he takes a picture of the lifeboat. After that, he hopped in the helicopter, flew back to South Africa, and he showed them. Is there going to be some sort of story behind this then? This picture to his superiors, and he was hoping they would launch some sort of investigation to see who was out there. But much like his team, who didn't care when they were already at Bouvet Island, his superiors, who are thousands of miles away from Bouvet Island, just didn't care very much about some random lifeboat on some random island in the middle of nowhere. But two years after Crawford's expedition, another crew was sent out to Bouvet Island to survey the lagoon where this lifeboat was found. And the crew would report that they found the lagoon, but there was no boat, there was no barrel, there was no copper tank, there was no oars, there was nothing. It was as if it was never there. So while we don't know how the boat got there or how it left or who was on the boat and where they went, what we do know is at some point, some poor soul or souls were trapped on the most isolated and wretched island in the entire world. Oh my days. No, thank you. The fourth chamber. Imagine being stuck on an island like that. Flipping. Now that is nightmarish stuff. In central Texas lies a stunning natural oh one. Is this real? This, this is just the green screen, right? Called Jacob's Well. It's this beautiful clear water spring that every summer when the weather gets really hot in Texas, people converge on Jacob's Well and enjoy swimming in the water. But it's not just for casual I thought this was going to be Jacob's Well, for God's sake. Swimmers trying to avoid the heat. It's for daredevils that strap scuba gear on and dive down through Jacob's Well through a 10 foot wide shaft that leads to one of the most intricate and dangerous underwater cave systems in the world. Jacob's Well is broken up into four chambers. As you move from chamber one to two to three to four, it gets harder and harder to squeeze through the narrow spaces and each of the chambers get smaller and they get darker because you're losing sunlight and they just become overall much more difficult to navigate the deeper you go. Imagine you put on your scuba gear and you hop into Jacob's Well and you start swimming straight down. Now there's gonna be what looks like the floor of the well and then at the center of it is a 10 foot wide shaft that goes straight down. And if you swim down through that, you're gonna reach the first chamber, which sits at about 30 feet and goes all the way down to 55 feet. In that first chamber, the sunlight still hits, so there's algae, there's wildlife, and it's where rookie scuba divers will spend their time in Jacob's Well. At the bottom of the first chamber is another shaft opening, but it's more narrow than the very first one you went through. And that shaft, that tunnel, is actually what makes up the second chamber. And it brings you down all the way to 80 feet. So from 55 feet to 80 feet, you are in the second chamber chamber and it's basically a tube. Any diver that's going to be in Jacob's well has to be aware when you are in the second chamber on your ascent to not go down the false chimney. The false chimney is this opening that looks exactly like the main exit out of the second chamber into the first chamber, but it's not. It's a dead end that loops around before you hit a wall and you gotta go all the way back oh out. My. So hopefully you have enough air at that point. The second- I hate these diving stories so much. Diving in these like small ass caves. It's just so anxiety inducing. Like they just, imagine that you're just stuck. <laughs> you're lost in the flipping cave system. The chamber attracts novice scuba divers and intermediate scuba divers. You still have light coming in, but it's definitely more tight, it's more claustrophobic, and because of that false chimney, it's a little bit more hazardous going into the second chamber. If you continue down past the 80 foot mark, which is the bottom of the second chamber, there is a very tight squeeze that you can barely get through with your tanks on that will bring you into a very small room that is the third chamber. At this point, the sunlight is gone, and there's all the silt and loose gravel inside of the third chamber that if your fin so much as knocks it, it will float into the water and then it will blind you. The third chamber is only from 80 feet to 90 feet. So it's only 10 feet of water. Generally speaking, you only see expert divers going into the third chamber. At the bottom of the third chamber is this heavy metal grate that sits over this tiny little opening. And that is the opening to the infamous fourth and final chamber of Jacob's Well. No one can describe what it looks like inside of the fourth chamber because one, as soon as you go in there, it's impossible not to kick up a ton of silt. So you're going in blind. 
but two, anyone that has attempted to go into the fourth chamber and maybe has been successful has died. There are literally divers that are deceased inside of the fourth chamber. And after about a dozen people died trying to get into that fourth chamber, they finally just sealed it up. But if you were to pry open that gate and go into the fourth chamber, you would have to remove your air tanks, push them into the fourth chamber, and then you'd have to wriggle your way through while keeping the mouthpiece in your mouth into the fourth chamber that again, we don't even know what's in there. In 1983, 24-year-old college students Richard Patton and Clark McConnell entered Jacob's Well around 8.30 p.m. They were both experienced scuba divers. They were in an advanced scuba diver class with all the certifications for that. They had dove Jacob's Well before and they wanted to check out the fourth chamber. They got in the water. They went through that initial shaft into the first chamber. They continued into the tunnel that was the second chamber. They wriggled their way into the third chamber and they reached the gate. Using some equipment they brought with them, they were able to pry open this gate and Richard Patton was the first one to go into the fourth chamber. He removed his tanks and pushed them inside of this opening. Why? And then he began head first to slither inside of this fourth chamber opening while Clark waited. And Clark would later say that as soon as Richard had pushed his way and had actually made it into the fourth chamber, Richard comes screaming up back out of the fourth chamber. And Clark realizes that he doesn't have a mouthpiece in. He doesn't have scuba tanks on. Richard is desperately trying to wriggle his way out on a breath hold because he's dropped his tanks and he's reaching for Clark to help him get pulled through this hole and he can barely get out of this hole. And as soon as he gets free, Clark takes his mouthpiece off and he jams it into Richard's mouth. And so they begin buddy breathing. One guy breathes while the other guy holds his breath and then they reverse that. Oh, back mate, this is making me feel so queasy, man. One man breathes and then the other... Oh, fuck that forth back and forth that's not something you would do on a dive for a long period of time it's an emergency procedure and you need to get to the surface as soon as you can so the pair calms down they're buddy breathing and they're making their way back up they're leaving the equipment that they lost in the fourth chamber and they're kicking their way up and they get back into the third chamber they make their way up into the second chamber they're kicking it out they're kicking it out and then their heads hit the wall and they realize they've gone down the false chimney and what's even worse is they hear that awful katung which means you have no air in your tanks. Clark, who had taken a full breath before this had happened, he immediately turns and starts swimming and manages to get out of the false chimney and makes it to the surface before he drowns. But Richard wasn't as lucky. His final few moments were spent in total darkness with silt kicked up all around him. He's got no air, he's got no idea where to go, and he's desperately trying to swim up, but he keeps hitting the wall of the false chimney before ultimately drowning. When recovery divers went down to retrieve his body, they found him jammed up at the very end of the false chimney. So that's going to do it. Mate, I'm good, man. That is oh, flipping hell. <sighs> Guys, I hope you enjoyed today's stories. Let me know in the comments what you thought, and I will pin the best comment at the top of the comments section. If you enjoyed today's stories and you haven't done this already, please. I would never, ever even think about diving. I hate K-diving, Matt. It's so fucking creepy the cave diving community really needs to get in the habit of sealing off false exit exit yeah that's a that's a good idea to be fair that's a very good idea whenever i hear mr borden say something like avid outdoorsman or really experienced dry diver hiker climber i think yeah they're gone <laughs> it's true isn't it because it sort of makes you realize okay like, hey, if they're experienced if they're good at this and they've managed to mess it up then god damn this is one messy situation but um yeah hopefully you enjoyed this reaction and yeah until next time i subscribe